All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Mark Cunningham. Uh, for those of you that don't know Mark, which is not very many of you because he's pretty famous, um, Mark is a fantastic property manager. He's a great father. He runs his business as well as anybody I have seen. And he's a good friend that I trust and like, and that's why we're doing this event together. Um, you guys should be striving to do what Mark does because I promise you, I don't see him working all the time, okay? And I know he makes serious money and he's very good with it. Some might say a little too good and frugal at it's times. because he makes me buy every time we go out. So he... Mark is a fantastic businessman and he is not owned by his business. He owns his business and it makes him money whether he's there or not. And that's kind of what everyone's striving for is Money comes in whether you're there or not. So whatever he's doing, he's doing exceptionally well. And I highly recommend you uh, pay very close attention for the next hour and 15 minutes because this guy knows what he's talking about. Mark Cunningham. Wow. That's, I want to take Dave with me everywhere I go and record that. Would you say it to my kids, please? Because they don't believe a word Dave just said. Uh, but, but thank you guys very, very much. And I hope so, thus far this has been um, a good event for you. So I flew in last night from Denver. I haven't been to Atlanta real often, but came in, came in through a snowstorm, so had some, some crazy travel there. But as Dave said, one of the reasons I can be here today is my company in Denver is kind of running itself to some extent. And that has happened very intentionally. It doesn't happen by itself. We all know that, don't we? And so what I really want to talk to you about is some things that we've put in place, and, and we're not any smarter than anybody else. We stumbled into this stuff. But things we've really put into place to make the company run better than it does without me. So that it runs better when I'm not there. I said to my, my VP of operations a few months ago, I said, you know, because I, I work from home on Fridays. So I, I don't come in on Fridays. And I said, Jessica, let me ask you a question. You know, I'm not here on Fridays. Do you think, like, you know, is that bad for the company because I'm not here to kind of like, you know, motivate everybody and, you know, I'm not here to be the, the cheerleader and, and, and the boss and like, do you think I should be here on Fridays? She kind of paused and looked at me, she said, Mark, you not being here on Fridays is the best thing this company could ever hope for. And I kind of didn't know how to take that, but I took it as a compliment. Okay, good, good, I won't be here, right? Because I don't, I don't need to always be there and that, that's, that's a plus kind of a thing. And the genesis of this whole thing for us as it relates to kind of creating a business that'll function uh, without us present focuses around systems, setting up strong systems in place to do the work for you. Does anybody know who that guy is? Truett Cathy. We're in Atlanta. This is rather appropriate, right? Isn't Chick-fil-A founded in Atlanta? I believe so. Yeah. So, th so the famous old story goes like this. Chick-fil-A, everybody's know Chick-fil-A, right? Does anybody not know Chick-fil-A? Well, don't raise your hand because you'll embarrass yourself. Everybody knows Chick-fil-A. So back in the 90s, Chick-fil-A is this growing company. And they had a problem. They had a big problem because they were facing competition from this new upstart company called Boston Market. Remember Boston Market? Yeah. And Boston Market was growing like crazy. They were taking market share away from Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A's revenue was dropping. Boston Market's revenue is increasing. Boston Market has stores popping up all over the place. So Chick-fil-A had a problem and a dilemma. So the story goes, they're in their big boardroom meeting, and Truett Cathy, the gentleman there on the right, he's, he's uh, since deceased a few years ago, he's sitting in this boardroom, and by this point in time, he's just kind of the old lion of the organization. He doesn't do a whole lot, but he, he attends the board meetings. So he's sitting at the head of the table, and he's listening to all of his top lieutenants around the table, screaming and shouting about what they need to do to get bigger faster. We've got to grow. We've got to grow faster. We've got to get bigger. We're getting eclipsed by Boston Market. We've got to grow, grow, grow. And so as the story goes, Truett Cathy stands up and he starts pounding his fist, just like that, on the table. And everybody goes quiet because this isn't him. And he stands up and he says, guys, gals, I'm sick and tired of listening to you talk about how we need to get bigger. When we get better, our customers will demand we get bigger. And he sits back down and everybody goes quiet. Think about that for a minute. When we get better, our customers will demand we get bigger. And that changed the trajectory for Chick-fil-A because they no longer focused on growth. They were like, let's not worry about growth. How do we get better? And they started doing things like, huh, maybe we should train our employees to be more um, diplomatic with customers, which Chick-fil-A is known for today, isn't it? You go into, and, and they're like, the, the kids are just great. They're very courteous. Maybe we should uh, improve our technology, which they've done. You go to a Chick-fil-A restaurant and what happens if the, the line in the drive-thru is too long. Does that happen to anybody? They come out to you 
with little iPads or whatever. They take your order coming out to you. Who does that? Chick-fil-A does it. Why? Because they change their focus. It wasn't about growth. I believe growth is a result of doing business well. We've never focused on growth. We've got, we'll, we'll hit a thousand doors this year. That's pretty cool for us. We've never focused on growth. Uh, I heard Deb say, you know, the second biggest expense in your company should be marketing, and that's, that's probably true. Not for us, though. We don't spend a lot of money on marketing. And a lot of us, I attribute to, to Dave Borden and their awesome website, but we do, we do video content marketing. We do marketing, but we don't pay for it. Why? Because we focus on, on being a good, solid company, and somehow the growth just kind of happens. And it's not magic, but it can happen if you are intentional about putting these things in place. And the way this formalized for us was this. My dad and I were on a flight. We were flying somewhere together. And it, I suppose I should back up for just a minute and tell you kind of who we are. You're thinking, who, who is this goofball up here talking talk about this company? In 1978, September of 1978, Jimmy Carter is in year number two of his presidency. Interest rates to buy a house are about 18%. The Bee Gees had the number one hit song on the radio. And my dad, at that point in time, decided he had fully vetted and trained himself to be a property manager slash real estate salesperson because he was a middle school teacher. So he dealt with little whiny kids all day long, just like we do. So he transitioned from teaching and he opened up a real estate property management company. Had no doors, had no clients, had nothing. He was gonna give it a shot. That, that takes courage, doesn't it? I mean, it was me and my brother at that time. He was a sole breadwinner, opened up a PM company. Grew slow and steady uh, over time. So I grew up in that world. I grew up in that industry and I was employee number one because I was free child labor. So my dad would have me painting properties, mowing lawns. I can remember him dropping me off like in bad parts of Denver with a mower and he'd be like, okay, mow these houses, I'll be back at five. A little creepy for a kid, but that's the world I lived in, right? So I grew up in that world and it gave me a unique view into real estate, into property management and into business. So as I got older in high school and college, I'd, I'd work for my dad in the summers and doing whatever he needed done around the office. Um, I went to Colorado State University I studied finance and real estate there, and I worked in some other property management companies after I graduated. And I was working up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Has anybody been to Cheyenne, Wyoming? Yeah, not the end of the world, but you see it, don't you? From right there, it's like, hey, there's the end, right there. And my dad called me one day and said, hey, I need to hire a property manager that job yours if you want it. I jumped to that opportunity, that was about 20 years ago. So at that point in time, we had three of us in the office. So we've grown slow and steady since then. Today, we've got a team of about 20 folks. Um, we manage residential and commercial both. We do sales. I'm an investor myself, so I own some stuff. Uh, our motto is follow the opportunity. Follow the opportunity. If there's an opportunity in real estate, let's look at it. If it's to sell a property, let's sell the property. If it's to buy a property and flip it, let's buy it and flip it. If it's to do property management, let's do property management. So our, our, our base, our foundation is property management and everything flows from there. So my dad's still active in the company uh, today. He's, he's finally almost ready, kind of, sorta, to retire because this is his baby and he loves what he does but he's down to like three days a week now, and he's actually enjoying his time out of the office. That's kind of cool to see. And I, I serve the role of president uh, for the organization, so I own it along with my dad and my brother. So, back up to 15 years ago, my dad and I are driving to the airport. My mom is driving us to the airport. We're gonna take a trip, I think it was a PM conference that we're going to. And at this point in time, we're telling my mom, hey mom, if something happens to us, because we're on the same flight, um, here's where the passwords are stored. And, and call this person, because they need to write some checks and do this. And we're, we're, we're kind of half serious, half joking, you know. But all of a sudden, it kind of dawned on us, like, huh, if something does happen to us, the company's in trouble. Like, we had it all up here. I, I had it up here. I was sharp. My dad had it up there. He was sharp. But it was only up here. And we thought, uh-oh, if something happens up here, or what if we just want to take a Friday off? What if I don't want to come in tomorrow? Couldn't happen. So we thought, you know what, we need to get everything out of here onto something. We need to, we need to somehow spew it out of here and document the process because we think that'd be easier for us. And so we, we stepped into this concept of let's start just getting everything out of our head and maybe the next time we hire somebody we start writing some processes down and that was kind of the genesis of, of systems and what we refer to today as position specific, that's important, position specific system manuals. So everybody in our office has a position specific system manual. I have a president system manual. It tells me what to do with my role of president. I'm pretty sure my brother wants my job because he's always sneaking around for that president position. So if I die, if I, my plane goes down and I don't make it back tomorrow, my dirty little sneaky brother will be president. He probably has something to do with the plane going down as well. So please check on that if we do it. Here's what I'm gonna talk about for the next hour. Number one, we were gonna talk about what is a system because a system means different things to different people. Number two, why you need it. I'm gonna try to convince you why you need one. Number three, how to create it. 
then how to implement it and how to improve it. Simple enough? I would like, my, my request is let's keep this somewhat conversational. So if I say something you don't understand, you disagree with, please just raise your hand and let's take the time to do that. Fair enough? And I know it's after lunch, guys. We're talking about systems at 145. This is hard. I get it. I get it. So stay with me. If you think it's hard to listen to me, you should see how hard it is to talk to all of you. Okay? So here we go. The foundation of a system is this. Variation, evil. Variation's evil. That's a little bit extreme, isn't it? But from a business standpoint, guys, that's true. Do we want variation in our PM's businesses? Variation will kill our businesses. If you don't buy into this statement, then save yourself the next hour and just leave the room and go check your emails. Because I hate variation. I hate it in the business. I want every client who comes through the door as a prospective applicant to be treated the same and to walk through the same leasing process every time, no matter if they're dealing with Pam, who's one of our leasing people, or Christina, who's a leasing person, or if they happen to get somebody random on the phone. It's gotta be the same every time. Because to the degree we're not consistent, it kills our business. It's a danger in so, so many ways. So we're trying to create some consistency. That's the foundation of everything we're talking about. Now, what is a system? Because again, systems means different things to different people. So let's step outside of our industry, forget your property manager for a moment, and let's pretend we're training to go to work here. Has anybody ever worked at McDonald's? None of you? Oh, you spoiled rich people. One. Richard. Only Richard. Only Richard. If we were training for McDonald's and we were going to be higher end McDonald's like managers, we would go to what's called McDonald's U, McDonald's University. They train people on how to work at McDonald's. Why? Because they believe in consistency. How can McDonald's take a 16 year old kid off the street, train him well enough to have this repetitive process to do it over and over and over again, that no matter what McDonald's you go in, whether it's in Denver, Colorado, or whether it's in Atlanta, Georgia, or you can even fly across the world and visit McDonald's. And the, the process, even the product, is gonna be relatively the same. Would anybody say the success of McDonald's is because of the quality of their food? Anybody? No, I've never had anyone raise their hand to that one, never. But why do they keep succeeding? It's a consistent process, isn't it? This morning I went to the Starbucks over here and I got myself a cup of coffee and the little yogurt thing with the granola on top and the berries inside. It tasted exactly like the granola with the yogurt inside. It, was, it, looked, it looked exactly the same like the one I get in Loveland, Colorado sometimes. How could that be? Did they call ahead and tell them what I wanted? No, that's their process, that's their system. They do it every time. McDonald's gets this and that's the hallmark of success. Now, you may be thinking, oh, Mark, that's, they make hamburgers, Mark. We're, I'm running a PM company here, buddy. That's easy compared to what we do. And it is. So let's look at a different industry. What about the airlines? I fly Southwest an awful lot. Man, Southwest is a great airline to fly. And Herb Keller just recently passed away. He was the ex-CEO. In an interview, they said, what's the key to success for Southwest? And everybody thought he was going to say friendly customer service, because that's what they're known for, aren't they? But he didn't, he didn't say that. He said it's our systems. Our systems are smooth. Back in the, was it the mid 80s, when uh, we were just starting off, he said, we had a problem, we had a big problem because we only had two planes and we had three routes. We didn't know what to do. So we decided to systematize the turnaround process when a plane lands, you get everybody off, you get everybody else back on. We decided to take that process down to 10 minutes. 10 minutes, guys, and they did it. I can't even fathom, that blows my mind. But the systems they have in place to run an airline all the way from checking in, getting your bags, to the pilot having a pre-flight checklist all systematized. And it works for their business. If it works for the airlines, I'm guessing it can work for us. Our business are a little bit less complex than even that. And you have a system right now and this is it. Your system is the way you do it. So that means when you tell your front desk person, hey, office opens at 9 a.m. I want you here at 9 a.m. At 9 a.m. unlock the door. And they do that, that's part of your system. When somebody comes into your office and they try to pay rent with cash and you say, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry, we, we don't take cash. We only take cashier's checks or whatever. That's your system. Now, it may only be in your head right now, but, but you have your system. What we want to do is get it out of our heads and document it into a process so then we can improve it from there. A couple other ways to think of systems are like this. Documented routine, right? We want to take the routine we do over and over and over, the boringness of property management, and document it. It's a playbook, a playbook for success or a roadmap for success in your business. I was visiting, um, oh, where was I? I was with my two boys, and we were at some, some mall store, and uh, it was a toy store. We went in the Lego store. 
in the Lego store, they had this giant Lego ship of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Have you seen that movie? Right? And the, the, the Captain Jack Sparrow boat. Massive, giant Lego ship. And you could lift up the front, and it had cannons that would shoot, and sharks. And it was, my, my kids were like, Dad, we want that. Oh, look at that. It was just glorious. I was like, guys, it's 200 bucks. Legos makes a lot of money. I went, Whew, crazy. And they were like, well, Dad, we saved up some money. Can we buy it? We want to make this. Well, it's your money. You guys want to spend it? I thought, you know what? This will pull them away from Fortnite for at least a few days. So yes, buy the Legos, guys. Please buy the Legos. Dad, leave them pay half. So we buy the, buy the Legos. We get home, and they want to build a Lego set. That's my two boys with their Lego set. Now, yeah, they're adorable. They get that from their dad. Yeah. So I don't know if you can see this box. This is when we get home. They're excited. Now, the box, see that in the left-hand corner there? Can anybody read how many pieces are in there? That's, that's 2,294 pieces. They put it on the box in small print so that dads won't see it. Because if you see it, you're not going to buy it. That's not 200 pieces. That's not 500 pieces. 2,294 pieces. So my kids get home. They open up and they dump these Legos everywhere. And my youngest son's like, Dad, we... You know, he's, in his mind, he's thinking of the big boat. Right? He's like, huh? What? He didn't... <laughs> They're like, oh, he didn't, couldn't even do this. Yeah, we, we don't know how to do this. Hey, you got to help us build this. I'm like, oh, Dad's not helping you guys build this. You guys are on your own. Then how are we supposed to build this, this giant boat? I was like, well, I don't know, guys. Let's look around. And so I, I reach into the box, and I pulled out this. I brought it with me. This is the Lego instruction manual for how to build that ship. Now, do you see how thick this is? This is 261 pages. It has 445 steps, 445 steps to build that. And I said, guys, here, follow this. I'm like, Dad, what, what are you talking about? It's an instruction manual. It's a system manual. And guess what? In about six hours, they built this thing because they, they followed this. Because this gave them a step. You know what step one is in this book? Open the box. You know what step two is? Dump the Legos out. I can follow that. Anybody can follow that. guys. If you need this many steps and this type of a system to build a silly Lego thing, if you're running your business without a system and you're succeeding, it's by pure luck and hard work and grit because we need processes. We need systems. We have to have them to this level of specificity on here's what time you show up. Here's how you answer the phone. Here's how you show a property. Here's how you process an application. Here's how you sign a lease. We've got to document it to this degree in order to make our businesses work. This is a page right out of our system manual. And we have um, kind of an introductory page. This is the concept of the system manual. I think, I think, see if this resonates with you a little bit. So this is as we're explaining a system manual to our team members, right? So I just hired you as a new team member and I gave you a system manual. I'm trying to explain to you what your job is going to be. And this is what page one of our system manual says, because it's explaining it. The system shall run the business and the team members shall run the system. All right, I got to interrupt myself right there because that's just good. Somebody should say amen or something to that. Listen to that. The system runs the business, and the team members run the system. Thank you. Thank you. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Somebody, we should get more amens in here, right? Isn't that good? That's pretty good stuff. I mean, that's the concept. We don't need to run the business. I don't run the business. My team members don't run the business. The system runs the business. And team members just have to plug in and run the system. Systems are simply roadmaps or instructions that allow the grace management process to be repeated and easily duplicated. Property management done on a large scale is an extremely complex business with many moving parts. In order for grace management to be successful, it must be consistent. The purpose of the system manual is to provide a consistent and specific way of doing business and to ensure that each property, resident, owner, and as much as possible each situation is treated the same. Also to define how grace management will do property management. That's that's the concept. Does that, make a little, does that resonate just a little bit? Guys, make me feel good and just say, yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you. Tough crowd in Atlanta. Okay, so what does the finished product look like? This, this is our property manager system manual right here. This is our, not, not terribly thick. We've got one of these for everybody. We've got 12, 11 positions in our company, so we've got 11 different position-specific system manuals. This is like our Lego, think Legos. Right? I'm a simple person, think Legos. This is our Lego instruction manual to what it looks like. Now, yes, it lives online, but I'll, I'm also a big believer in the, the old paper version because that, from a train process, that works well. 
So let me, let me take a half step backwards, and we'll, and we'll get to how to create this in just a second, but let me convince you why. Let me give you a, a dozen rough reasons why I think you need a system. Number one, stops the revolving door to your office. Have you ever had a repetitive question from an employee that you're like, you idiot. You don't say that, hopefully. <laughs> don't you remember I told you that? Or this is the fourth time you've asked me that? Has anybody ever had that, or is it just me? Okay, because when you tell an employee something, guys, you, you talk too much. We all talk too much. They don't remember that stuff. They don't remember when you tell them. Now, if, you, if it's written down and documented, now that's different. Now they can go to that. So it stops that revolving door of your office of, hey, boss, you got a minute? Ugh, I hate that. Number two, impl improves employee training. Uh, we've hired a lot of folks recently, and our training process is just night and day compared to what it used to be because the entire process centers around going through the system manual, line by line by line by line. That is the training process. I don't need to sit down with them and say, okay, well, first you do this, and then you do that, and, and are, are you writing this down? Because you need to write all this down. And then, oh, no, wait, I forgot about that step between those two. That's a terrible training process. That's how a lot of us do it. We go out of memory and we expect them to be successful? Won't work. Number three, reduces liability. If the worst thing happens, and let's say your leasing person has a fair housing issue, right? And they, they discriminated. They just blew it. And HUD comes knocking on your door. Anybody had HUD come knocking on there? Oh, you don't want to raise your hand. Yeah, okay. HUD comes knocking on your door. If you as the PM, if I can say as the PM, hey, HUD, investigator person, I realize that my person blew it, right? They, they did whatever. But, but you know what? I've got a director of leasing system manual, and, and we train on how to do this stuff. Like, they didn't follow our documented processes. Now, that will not totally release me from liability, but it will reduce the liability greatly. Because I can show, look, they, they acted rogue. This is what we do. This is how we process applications. And the fact that they didn't follow it, oh, I'm sorry, you know, it, it just it, it reduces that liability. Number four, increases company value. We've bought a number of competitors the last couple years, and when we buy them, we buy their book of business. And a book of business, an account, isn't worth a lot, because they could leave. Right? They're just not. I, I didn't pay a premium for any of these businesses. Now, if you came to us, you said, Mark, I've always wanted to live in Colorado. I love the idea of free marijuana. I think I want to move out there. How much for grace management? You, you will pay a premium to buy our company because we have systems. We, if we lose an account, no problem. We can replicate it. If we lose an employee, no problem, we can replicate them. Systems increase the value of your company like nothing else will do. Number five, sets expectations for employees. Ugh, any one of these I could talk on for 20 minutes. This is what creates the idea of, hey employee, here's what you do and here's how you do it. This is what I expect of you. Because unmet and unrealized expectations between you as the boss and your employee as a team member lead to disaster. Number six, get you in compliance with a policy and procedure manual. This is not a policy and procedure manual, practically speaking. Definitionally and legally, it is. So when the Real Estate Commission used to come in to audit us, and in Colorado we had to have a PNP manual, they'd say, hey, where's your PNP manual? They'd say, just one moment. We'd go back into the stock room. I'd be digging frantically. And I'd find, you know, here it is, right here. And they'd, they'd check the box, got it, right? That's a goofy PNP manual. Now, this can be that, but it gets you in compliance with that. Number seven, creates a storage location for all your templates. We put into the system manual all the templates, everything from big templates like your lease agreement, your management agreement, but have you ever had a great email response to an upset owner client who thinks you overcharged for maintenance and you're like, oh, that's good. I need to hold on to that. Well, how are you going to hold on to it? You document it. You create a template for it and, and pop it into your system manual and it lives there. So the next time that's, that next owner gets upset and emails a PM, your PM knows because their system manual tells them if the owner has an upset question on maintenance, refer to template 3A, and they copy and paste and email it to them. Let's you feel okay with delegating and giving up control. Please raise your hand, and you have to participate. Raise your hand if you're a control freak. Ooh, that's a lot of us, that's a lot of us. I, and I'm right there, right? I am a control freak. I don't like not knowing what's going on in my office. And this, to this day, it, it's just hard for me. But be, I can do it because I know my team's running the system back there. I'm okay with delegating. I'm okay with giving up control a little bit more. Number nine makes everyone replaceable. Now, this doesn't mean we don't value our employees, right? I love my team. We treat them well. We pay them well. We don't have a lot of turnover. We're big, big, big on employees and team members. But I also realize that at some point in time, every one of them will leave. They will. They're going to have a baby. They're going to move away. They're going to get married. They're going to do whatever they do, and they're going to leave. And when that happens, the business has to keep going. We lost our leasing person Six months ago, Lindsay, and Lindsay was awesome. Lindsay was a rock star. 
But she came into my office one day and she was like, you know, she's young, she's 25, single, um, her and her boyfriend, she's like, you know what, my, my boyfriend and I, we're just kind of bored, we're going to move across the country, we're moving to the East Coast. I was like, oh, why? I like, well, I mean, I, I like it here, but I'm young, we're going to give it a shot. Oh, I hated to lose Lindsay, she was amazing, but it didn't kill the company. Why? Because all she was doing is following the system. Now I just have to go find someone else to replace the system. It also helps you replace, though, your crazy employees. Think of the crazy employee in your office. Think about them, picture them in your head. And by the way, because every, every company has a crazy person. If no one comes into your head right now when I told you to think about the crazy person, guess what? You're the crazy it's you. It's you. You're the one. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Number 10, creates a consistency of outcome. Right? It's going to make the process, if they run it, the same every time. Number 11, makes the business scalable. This is what has allowed us to grow. We just had a person who was kind of overloaded on work, and, and, and we have been growing a fair amount. They said, I, I can't do it anymore. I need, I need help. So creating a new role was as simple as opening the document for their system, copying and pasting half of it out, and creating a new role. That's it. it was just, it's very scalable. It makes the business very, very scalable. Number 12, it prioritizes the tasks and work to be done. You want your team members working on what's important to you. And unless you tell them what is important to you and they understand their defined role, they're not going to know what to do. Have you ever had someone like in an attempt to be helpful, do something that you're like, why, why are you doing that? I wanted you to do this. Well, I just thought I would do this. That's not what you're here to do. I want you to do this. Does that happen to anybody? Just me. Okay. Takes you from reactive to proactive. Right? We don't want to be reactive. We want to be a proactive business as much as possible. And number 14, it simplifies the execution of every task. If we can break down these complicated tasks into little bite-sized pieces, think Legos, then we can make it work. We can train anybody. We can train a 16-year-old kid off the street to be our director of leasing. Why? Because they're just going to follow the steps. Do this, do this, do that. And lastly, it sustains the business beyond you. You don't want the business to be dependent upon you. To the degree you can't be out of your business, your business is weak. I asked uh, a guy one time, so, so tell, let, me, let me ask you a question. How long could you be away from your business without the business needing you? He thought for a minute, he said, well, do you want my answer in uh, minutes or seconds? <laughs> Bad answer, right? We don't want businesses that need us. If our business needs us, you don't own a business. You own what? You own a job, right? I don't want, it. I don't want to own a job. I want to own a business. So it's going to sustain that business beyond us. Did I convince you why you need a system? Because I got nothing else. If you're not convinced, sorry. Now, this is not what it is, guys, because this is what you're thinking. You're like, Mark, I know this thing you're talking about. It's in your head, man. It's unicorns and fairies and lollipops on rainbows. It doesn't exist. You can't do that. And while our business isn't quite like that, actually, that's a picture, picture of my office. I'm, I'm in the upper window of the castle there. Right? It's not quite like that, but it's pretty close, guys. It's pretty good. It really, really is. And it's not because we're anything magical, but because we put this stuff in place. So here we go. How to create. Let's pretend we're going to create this from scratch. Here are the steps that we walked through and that you would want to walk through. And the reason I'm going through this step by step is because you've got to understand it to make it work. If I handed you and just gave you, I was like, hey, here you go. Thanks for coming. You all get free system manuals of the whole thing we do. It would do you no good unless, unless you understand what it is and how, how it works. So that's why we're going to kind of go through this step by step. Now, as we create this, here's what we have to remember. We're going to document a combination of what our business is today plus what we want it to be tomorrow. If your business stinks right now, don't just go document all the stinkiness. Fix it, right? So let's document what works and let's edit what's not working to make it more effective. So step one, list the major functions of the company. Simple enough. So it may look like something like this. We do rent collection. We've got to do accounting and leasing and tenant relations. We've got to manage our office, manage owners, employees, take care of maintenance coordination, new account, vendor oversight, property inspections, and you could add a few more. But the, by and large, this is what we all do. These are the major functions of the company. Simple enough. That's step one. Step two, we want to assign a job title to each function. So let's take each of those major functions, because remember, we're kind of creating this imaginary company. We're not just documenting what you're doing today. We're improving it as well. So let's create a job title for each one of those functions. So for example, the person in charge of rent collection, let's call them our director of accounting. Our vendor oversight person, let's call them our vendor coordinator. Our accounting person, now we're going to assign that task, just like we did on rent collection, to the same person. Right? So some, one person can have more than one task. And what that's going to do, if we assign a job title to each position, is it's going to give us a list 
of job titles. Now, I'm not big into job titles, so don't worry about that, but we're just trying to get, walk through the steps here. So it's going to leave us with something like this. Here's a list of job titles for a company. Now, whether you are a one-man or one-woman shop, or you're managing 4,000 doors, every one of these roles is being fulfilled to some extent in your organization. Right? You have someone who is doing accounting. You have someone who's doing accounts payable. So these are, the, these are the positions we want to have. OK, step number three. List five to 10 KRAs, key result areas for each job title. List five to 10 key result areas for each job title. You say, now, what's a KRA? I'm glad you asked. KRAs, def definitionally, are the essential tasks or activities that that title is. And what's the word after that in red? What? Completely responsible for it. Guys, if two people are responsible for something, nobody's responsible for that thing, right? We want to dissect this stuff down so every person and only one person is responsible for it. Conceptually, it means that that job title doesn't do it. It doesn't get done. And remember, we're not talking about how to do anything yet. We're just talking about what to do. What do we want these imaginary people in our company to be doing? So here's an example. So for our director of leasing, the person that's responsible for, le for leasing, these are their KRAs, their key result areas. If, you, if I hired you as my leasing person and you said, Mark, what, what do I do all day? I'd say, ah, these are the seven things you do all day. You, do, you take phone inquiries, you take email inquiries, you schedule showings, you do showing presentations, you do application processing, lease signing and movement coordination. Is that about the same to some extent as to what your leasing person does? Now, you may have automated it, right? You say, well, Mark, we don't, we don't schedule showings. We use, what does somebody use? Tenant Turner to do that for us. Great. Who's, who's responsible for maintaining Tenant Turner? Well, this person is. So, so maybe that KRA is, is as simple as keep Tenant Turner updated and activated with all properties, and here's how you log in, and here's how you do it. Right? We can still automate, but just because you automate doesn't mean the process goes away. You're just tweaking the process. I'll show you another one. So for a property manager, one of their KRAs, their key result area, or excuse me, all of their KRAs are right here. These are the jobs our property managers do. And people ask me, Mark, what do your PMs do? This is what they do. It's right in their system manual. They're responsible for resident relations. They're responsible for owner relations. They're responsible for security deposit returns. They have to prepare and list new properties for rent. They assist the director of accounting with delinquent rent collection. And they do maintenance coordination. That's all. That's it. And one of the beauties of this is when we're hiring, I can tell people this is what you do. This is your job. I'm not telling you how to do it yet, but these are the things you're responsible for doing. I'll show you one more. For our director of accounting, their KRAs are as simple as this. Create bank deposits. Post the bank deposits into that folio. Prepare three-day demand notices. Drive the collection of delinquent rents. Process NSF payments. Close out the monthly accounting cycle. And drive the ex-resident collection process. So we're going to assign five, six, seven KRAs to each job title. We're not assigning 50. If it's 50, it becomes a checklist. I am convinced if you walked into my office right now and you went to any one of my team members and said, hey, what are your KRAs? They could spit those out. I, I believe they could. If they can't, then they need to be fired because they have to know them. This is what they do all day. This is all they do all day. It keeps me and my team member on the same page with what they're responsible for. All right, so let's go back to our steps. So we listed the major function of the company. We assigned a job title to each function. We listed five to 10 KRAs. And by the way, again, the reason we don't want more than 10 is because it comes a laundry list and people can't remember 20 things. Number four, create a measure of success and you gotta get this one if your neighbor's sleeping, wake them up. Create a measure of success for each KRA. And a measure of success is simply a metric that defines what winning looks like. If, if I hire you in my office as my new property manager, don't you think you want to know what doing a good job looks like for our company? So, have you ever had a job like that where you didn't quite know what you were supposed to be doing and you didn't know how good of a job you were doing until the boss told you? Boss, am I doing a good job? I, I've had employees ask me, hey, am I doing a good job? Like that's a dagger in my heart because you should know if you're doing a good job. Why? Because we define it. This is what doing a good job looks like. We're going to define a measure of success for each of your KRAs. Now, a measure of success as you're creating it has to meet three criteria. Number one, it's got to be super specific, nothing general and vague. Number two, it's got to be timely. There always needs to be a time aspect to measure it. And number three, it actually has to be measurable. It can't just be something that I'm not going to be able to check on. So let me give you some examples. We're going to do a group exercise here together. I'm going to give you an example. So our director of leasing, one of her KRAs, one of the things she's responsible for is phone inquiries. We're not telling her how to do it yet, but you're responsible for it. I'm hiring all of you as my director of leasing, and this is one of your KRAs. 
Now I've got to create a measure of success so that you as the employee know if you're succeeding as it relates to those things. So let me give you a couple potential measures of success and you tell me if these meet the definition of a measure of success. Timely, measurable, specific. Would this be a good one? Return phone calls quickly. Why? Yeah, because quickly to you might mean three days as my new employee. Quickly to me as the boss could mean three minutes, right? That's not, that's not a measure of success. How about this, do your best to call back and be friendly. I mean, we want that to happen, but that's not, that's not measuring success. Uh-oh. Here we go. Uh, call should be returned as soon as possible. No. Here's what ours is. Return each phone call the same business day it was left. Return each phone call the same. Is that specific? Is that, could I measure that? I mean, if I have processes in place to measure that? It is it timely? Every day. If I hire you and all I tell you is, hey, hey, new leasing person, this is your measure of success. Return each phone call the same business day it was left. Is there any ambiguity in your mind at all what I expect of you to do? And if you don't do it, I just point to this. Hey, th this is your, it's right here. What do you mean you called him two days later? I don't, it doesn't turn into, a, oh, I thought, I thought you said I could because, no, 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 this is the measure of success. It's right here. Do it this way. Let me give you a different example. So for a property manager, one of their KRAs is resident relations. Would this be an appropriate measure of success for resident relations? Keep residents happy. No, because they just give them a free rent credit every month. That wouldn't work too well. How about provide the highest level of customer service? Yeah, makes me want to throw up. Timely respond to all tenant phone calls. No, here's ours. Receive one written compliment and no complaints each month. One written compliment and no complaints each month. Now, does this happen every month? Of course not. But this is the goal. This is the expectation. This is what we're striving for. Because I figure as the boss, because part of this is to give them simplicity of what I expect, but part of it's for me to be able to measure their success. And I can pretty much judge that if I see one compliment come in per month on a PM from a tenant and no complaints, like none at all, I can pretty much gauge that as it relates to resident relations, they're doing a fair job. Would that, would that be fair to say? Would you agree with that? Let me give you one more. Our new account specialist. This is the person that's responsible for new accounts. When leads come in, they've gotta go chase those leads. One of their KRAs is the sign-up process. Right? They've gotta get that new client owner signed up through our process. So what should be our measure of success? How about this, get all documents signed by new owner. But what do you think? It's not timely. Have you ever had a new, and Brad talked about this, a new client comes in and what do you say, like nobody calls them back for three days, right? Has that ever happened to anybody else kind of a thing? So that, that wouldn't be a good one. How about have owner sign management agreement and collect money? A little bit better. Closer, yeah. Have owner e sign management agreement and you countersign, ugh, here's ours. Have the new account checklist completed and in the inbox of the DA within 24 business hours of the new owner requesting to work with GM. That's a mouthful, I get it, but is that specific? So once that new owner says, yep, I wanna work with you guys, you've got 24 hours to complete the new account checklist, which is a checklist, and get it in the inbox of the director of accounting. Clock's ticking, no ambiguity at all. Very, very specific. I'm gonna give you one more. This is from my system manual. I'm the president. I've got measures of success as well. One of my KRAs is financial health. The company's gotta be healthy financial, financially. How about this, review financial statements each month. I mean, it's a good thing to do, but that's not how, I'm gonna, how we're gonna measure success. Ensure the company is financially strong, no. Meet with the financial advisor each year, again, good. Here's what it is, achieve a 6% annual quarter over quarter net income growth. Is that clear? Is that straightforward? Do I know what the company expects of me as it relates to the financial health of the company based upon that measure of success? That was the easiest question today, guys. That, that, just nod your head. We need some coffee in here immediately. All right, so here we go. We're listing the major functions of the company. We assigned a job title to each function. We listed five to 10 KRAs for each job title. We created a measure of success. Now step five, and this is where it gets messy. Now we're gonna write the detailed step-by-step -step describing how each KRA will be done in order to achieve the measure of success. So here's the concept. We said, okay, here's what you have to do. Here's your KRA. This is what you're responsible for. Then we jumped past how to do it, and we said, here's how we measure success. That's what you're responsible for. Here's what winning looks like. Now we're gonna go back into the middle and say, here's how you do it. 
and this is what takes some time. Because now you're going to document the step-by-step -step process of how to get from here to here, how to take the phone call, how to do the showing, how to process the application. And the question always comes up underneath this concept is, well, Mark, how, how detailed should that be? Like, do I just say process an application? Do I say just show a property? Or how detailed do I need to be? That, that's a fair question. So let's step back, back outside of our industry for a minute and let's go back to McDonald's. How detailed do you think McDonald's is in their process of training to their employees? Highly detailed or low detailed? Highly detailed. Have you ever noticed? Who's ever had a hamburger from McDonald's? You, you all have. Come on, even the healthy people. Admit it. We've all had a hamburger from McDonald's. Raise your hand, for those of you being truthful, if you've ever eaten a hamburger at McDonald's and you've had the pickles fall out while you're eating the hamburger. Has that ever happened? It, yeah, it did happen to you? Shoot, you're ruining my point. Never mind. Okay, you be quiet. Be quiet. Other than this gentleman, it's never happened. You know why? Because McDonald's trains their employees on where to put the pickles on the hamburger. The pickles go in the center of the hamburger. They always go in the center of the hamburger, and they have to overlap in a little star formation. Why? So pickles don't fall out when they eat them. They train their people. This is where the pickles go on the hamburger. And it makes sense because other than you must have a bad employee at McDonald's or a bad chef, it doesn't happen. They train their people with specificity to that degree. Here's another example at McDonald's. I was driving through the drive-through of McDonald's. I, I'm not a big McDonald's guy, but sometimes when I travel, I'll go there in the morning, on my way to the airport, I'll go through the drive-through and I'll get a McGriddle. Has anybody had McGriddles? Oh, they're to die for, guys. They are so good. And I'm waiting in line at the drive-through of McDonald's for my McGriddle. And it was one of those dual lines, you know, where there's like two car lines that can come through. And so I had my window down, and I could hear the person inside the McDonald's restaurant taking the orders. And I noticed that when somebody would come up, they had one of three greetings every time. Good morning, welcome to McDonald's, may I take your order? It's a beautiful day, what would you like for breakfast? And, and something else. And every time, they had one of those three greetings. And that was it. They did not deviate. They had two people in there. Neither one of them deviated from those three greetings. Do you think that was just coincidence? I don't think so. I think McDonald's told them, hey, employee, when somebody comes through, this is how you greet them. This is what you say. And you don't say anything other than this. Now, you may say, well, Mark, that's going to that's gonna stifle the employee, the creativity of my employees. I want my employees to use their creativeness. And I get that. I get that. But I have a 13-year-old son. If McDonald's hired my son, I don't know if it would be that smooth unless they trained him. Because I came home from work not too long ago. I said, hey, Gabriel's my son. Hey, Gabriel. And he goes like this, sup, dad, sup. I go, what? He goes, sup. I said, what, what is that? He goes, dad, it means what's up. And I said, well, I know what it means, but why are you acting like an idiot? What's wrong with you? And he goes, dad, this is what the cool kids do, sup. He turns around and walks away. Like, okay, whatever, Gabriel. So, if McDonald's hires Gabriel, and you drive through the drive through window, you're going to get greeted with a, sup. What can I help you at McDonald's today if it's Gabe working there? Why? Because that's the way Gabe greets people. Kids are crazy. Adults are crazy. Leasing people are crazy. Property managers are crazy. So we need to train our people. This is how you greet people. This is how you show a property. This is, we need to get super, super specific in what we want people to do and how to do it. Otherwise, you're going to get surprised with the sup when you hire my son. Our Legos, I told you, here's a, this is a screenshot of directions number one out of the Lego box. I love this. I had to take a picture of it. Here's, remember I told you there's like 400 instructions? Here's number one, open the box. Number two, empty the bags. That's it. Any of us can follow that. My little goofy son could follow that. That was instruction one and two. Now to build this massively beautiful ship I was telling you about, to give you an idea of how detailed it is, this was page, uh, I don't know what it is, 200 and something. This is instruction number 196. Find that one piece. And you put it right here. That's it. That's, that's page, I didn't show the page number. That's instruction 196. Any of us can follow that, right? A six-year-old kid can follow it. And this is just building Legos. We need to make sure our system and processes of training our people are that level of detail. Find this Lego, stick it right there. Turn the page. Simple enough. Don't think for a moment, though, that your system manuals are just big, glorified checklists. If you buy into that, you're not getting everything you can out of it. It's not just a big checklist of do this, do this, do this, do this. You need to make sure that you are training your people how you want them to do that. And I'll show, let me give you an example. So for our new account specialist, 
One of their KRAs, their key result areas, is new client meeting. If a client comes into the office or is interested in our service, they've got to meet with them. So on one of the pages of our system manual, it says this. I'm just giving you an example of how this is not a checklist. It says this. If there is ever any doubt as to the quality of the owner, it is best to not work with that owner as a client. The GM business model is not a fit for every property owner. While our services are recognized as some of the best in the industry, our process is generally designed for hands-off owners. Let me just stop there for a minute. Does every, would all of you in your companies buy into that statement? I mean, I mean, maybe yes, maybe no though, right? I mean, some companies are like, no, that, I disagree. Like, I want every client I can get, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But for our business model, this is what we're doing. So what that means is, if I hire a person and they came from your company, and your company was all about like, growth, 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 you, you close that deal. You close every deal you can. And they come into my business with that mentality, I'm gonna look up in six months and I've got all these crummy owners. Why? Because I never trained them that we don't want every owner. I'm documenting the process. You need to let some owners go. We don't want every owner. They're not all a good fit. It goes on to say, while we do want to cater our services to the needs of the individual owner, this must be done within reason to ensure, we're not, to ensure we are able to meet their expectations. It's imperative that the new account specialist understand the expectations of the prospective owner and also that the NAS set proper expectations at the beginning of the working relationship. Clear expectations are a foundation of the future relationship and will be established at the beginning of the relationship. So be sure that we are setting those expectations, not the client. Owners that are overly demanding, aggressive, argumentative, or seeking the lowest priced are best served using a different property management company. Now, whether you agree with it or not isn't my point. My point is, do you at least now understand the way Grace Management is going to do business? And what, if I hire all of you as my new account specialists, my expectations of you as it relates to, to talking to new clients? It makes sense, doesn't it? It's a, tra it's a training tool. Because now I'm able to have you think like me. I want, to some extent, this is going to sound arrogant, so I hope you know where I'm coming from. I want people in my organization to be able to handle problems the way I would handle them. I want my words to pop into their head when that owner says, well, why won't you, what, what do you mean? You're overcharging me. I don't want them to have to think on their feet and come up with their rationale. I want them to use the words that I've used time and time again when I hear that. So if I don't document it, how are they ever gonna know it? They're not gonna remember it unless I write it down. Now, let me pause there for a second. Any questions at this point? I'm doing an awful lot of jabbering up here. It's been very quiet. The question was, do we use additional formatting as well, or is everything in a three-ring binder? We use additional formatting as well. All of our systems live online, but there's something magic about having a documented system manual. If you walked into my office now and went to anyone, any one of my team members, they're going to have their system manual probably within arm's reach of what they're doing. And there's a lot of rationales for this, but I'll give you a couple. One is the human brain remembers things when it reads it on paper. The human brain doesn't retain things nearly as effectively when you read it on a device. Studies show this time and time again. There was a, a recent one, a very famous one, um, where they took all these, all these kids, all these college students, broke them into two random groups, and they let the one group read like the, the information out of a textbook before a test on, out of a, a textbook. Right? You can read it from here, but you can only read it twice. And then they let the other group read the same information online as many times as you want it. The group that read from the textbooks killed the scores of the other kids, killed them. Because the brain remembers, and, you, and this is true for all of you, you know why? The brain remembers where things are on, that, on the paper. If you're trying to recall something you've read and you think about it, you brain will, you'll think, you'll think, oh yeah, that was kind of in the upper right-hand section of the page. This is how our brains work. And it's not true for digital. And I like the idea as well that my people can, they can highlight it, they can circle it, they can make their little notes on there. So there's something, there's something truly magical about having it in paper format. Now that means we run a lot of paper. I am no friends of the tree huggers because I print, if we update our system manual, that page is going in the trash, we're printing out the new one, it goes right in. And I've had some people say, oh, that's, I'm not gonna do it just for that reason. That's, that's, that's too much printing. <laughs> okay, that, that, that's your rationale. But all, all I can tell you is it, it works for us. It's grown us to a company the size we're at today, doing it the way we're doing. And I've had people say as well, well Mark, you're old school. Binders? Are you serious? You use binders? Yes, I use binders. You know what? We've got about a thousand doors under management with 20 people. I don't know if it'll work to get us bigger, but it worked to get us here. 
So maybe we're old school, but it works, and it's still effective and efficient at our size. Do we have a workflow management program? We do not have a workflow management program other than, um, depending on what the process is, the system will tell them what the workflow is. It, it'll say, you know, it, remember a moment ago I said for the new account specialist, they have to print the new account checklist. So the new account checklist is gonna have 25 things in there. And one of the things may say, you know, activate the owner in that folio, and they'll say collect the money over there. Now, you could take this stuff and plug it into like a um, podio. Is that what it is, right, podio? You could plug this stuff into there, but you have to have something to plug into there. I've, you know, I've talked to other folks, they say, well, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna put it all into here. That's fine, you can put it into there, but you've gotta have something to put into there. You gotta create something from there. So that, yeah, workflows are great. I'm a huge believer in workflows. You got a question up here? Yeah. How often do you revisit the... Good question. How often do we revisit the system? The system manual, as I explain it to my team, it's a living, breathing document. It never is done, because we're always improving. We're always changing. And a little bit later, I'll talk about how we improve it on an ongoing basis, but it's not a one and done. And that's some of the, the frustration for all of us, isn't it? Of, ugh, you mean I gotta keep, I can't just do it and be done? Well, do you want your business to improve? If you want your business to improve, you gotta keep improving the system. Because why? Because what's running the business? The system. Gold star, right here. Somebody else, uh, yeah, yeah. Do we review the system manual with the employees to make sure they haven't customized it? Yes, absolutely. And we'll, get, we're, we're, you're three steps ahead of me. We're getting there, we're getting there. Because yes, we have to continue to improve it and make sure people are up to speed. Are there, are there questions right now? Y'all staying awake, y'all with me? Guys, you should give yourself a pat on the back. You're talking about systems in, after lunch in the afternoon. I know it's boring, but it's necessary. Okay, uh, step number six, we're gonna organize, insert, Templates, now what, what are templates? Well, templates are some of these things, right? Canned email responses, any checklist you have, your lease and management agreement, your training info, fair housing guidelines, all those documents, things that you're like, ugh, I need, I need to keep this. Here's the, here's the HUD guidelines on fair housing. Where should, that, where should you put that? Where does that live? It needs to live somewhere. So every template we have lives only in one place. It lives inside of one of our system manuals. It'll be assigned to that system manual as a template within that system manual. All right, number four, how to implement the system manual. There's two different ways to do it. Small office, big office. Raise your hand, and again, everyone must participate. Raise your hand if your office has more than five team members. If you have five or more, raise your hand. Okay, so everybody else has less than five or they're asleep. We'll go with less than five. If you've got a one man, one woman shop, you may not even need this stuff. Right? If, if your goal with your company is you just run it, and then you retire and you just let the accounts go away, you don't need this stuff, you don't. If, however, you want to grow it, you want to take some time off, you've got a larger team, you, you need to implement it. The way we implemented this initially, because we had like four of us in the office, is we created a system manual for the next hire, because we were growing, and we said, you know what, we need to hire a leasing person, we need some help leasing. Now, and I knew how to lease, because at that point in time, everyone in our office did everything. Have you been there, where everyone's doing everything, and it works great. It works great with 100 doors and three people. It doesn't work with 700 doors and seven people, or however many, you can't all do everything. So he said, we're gonna hire a leasing person. So I sat down and I thought, I'm gonna write down a step-by-step -step of how to lease, because this is what I want the person to do. And it was like, show up 10 minutes early, bring cleaning supplies with you, turn on all the lights, welcome the individual, greet them with a handshake, here's how you, here's how you tour the property, here's how you don't tour the property, Here's how you show, it was specific stuff. Now it's gotten even better since then, but I think a great way if you're gonna do this, if you're interested in doing this, is to create one, one, in, one employee at a time, and especially if you have a new hire coming on. Do not hire your next person until you have a system manual for them. Don't do it. Because you, a system manual sets them up for success. If you're planning on hiring somebody in 2019, I would hit the pause button until you create some, even if it's a bare bones, create some system manual because you, you owe it to them. Your job is to make them successful. And a system manual is gonna help them to succeed or fail on their own. So that's the easiest way to implement it from that standpoint. Now, if you say, well, gosh, Mark, I've got a team of 10 people and they're all high performers and, and yeah, you know, how do we bring system manuals in? 
That's where you have to decide on a person-by-person -person basis if you want the person creating it or if you want to create it for them. So for example, I've got some people that they're good employees. I wouldn't let them near the editable version of this if my life depended on it. Because they can follow instructions, but they can't create this stuff. Right? Think the McDonald's guy. They don't let the 16-year-old kid from McDonald's write the system. They just tell them to follow it. Right? So you need to decide if you have a person like that, or do you have the person that you say, hey, this is like a systems person. This is somebody that gets it. I want them to document the process. And then you simply go to that person and say, hey, leasing person, hey, Jennifer, I love the way you lease. You lease, like, you're amazing. I wish I had 10 more of you. And I know you won't always be here because maybe I'll promote you. Maybe you'll run off and do something crazy. But, I, but for the good of the company, we need to start documenting what you do and how you do it. Not because I'm, I'm going to get rid of you, but because I want more of you. So let's create the, let's create the system. Let's, and then you walk them through this, the steps. Let's create the measures of success. Let's create the carries. And I'm going to show you where, and I'll, I'll give this stuff to you um, on, on the, the bones here in a couple minutes. Does that make sense from an implementation side? Questions on that? How are we doing on time? OK. Well, we will, because we're a little ahead of schedule, what we will do, we'll cut off at uh, no later than 3. Can you hang with me for 25 more minutes? Whew. OK. Now, when you're implementing these things, you don't necessarily want them to implement them around your current team. You want to implement your team around the systems. A bad team member or wrong team member cannot be fixed by a good system. If you think, oh, maybe this will finally fix Crazy Bill. This won't fix Crazy Bill, guys. You can fix Crazy Bill when you fire him. This will not fix the wrong person. Right? What you want to do is create the position, and then you hire for the position. Have you ever heard that concept? Hire for the position, don't, what is it? What's the flip-flop? You don't create a position for the person, you create a person for, does anybody know what I'm talking about? In my head, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense up here. All right? The idea is you create the ideal role, then you go find a person to fill that role. We don't want to take a person and say, well, gosh, they're kind of weird, but they've been with me for three years, so how am I going to create a position for them? No, don't do that. You create the ideal position and then go find the person that can fill that role. So if you want to see this stuff, okay, so that, that's our, that's our um, systems website stuff, right? So propertymanagementsystem.org. If you go to our products page, go to systems, you're going to see this is a screenshot. You can download that very first thing. See up at the top there, number one? Organizational roadmap for system manuals. What we've done is we've put in, and this is a screenshot of it, we've listed every KRA that we have for our company, every position title, and every measure of success on a spreadsheet that you can download for free. Step one for you if you want to do this is just to go into there, and here's my challenge to you. And for those of you coming to day two tomorrow, this is what we're going to do to begin that class. We're going to write down the name of the person who's responsible for that item. And you think, well, that sounds easy. That sounds simple. It, it, it should be, but it's interesting. Because when I do this with people, they'll be like, huh, prospective owner follow-up. So our measure, so this is our, this is our new accounts person. Their KRA is prospective owner follow-up, right? Lead comes in, they've got a follow-up. What's their measure of success? Make personal phone call contact to each owner lead within one hour from the time the inquiry was submitted. And I'll be sitting down with you and you're filling this out and you say, well, actually, Mark, I've got, I've got, um, Two or three people that actually could do that. Oh, do, well, which one of them does it? Well, just as whoever happens to get to it first. That's, a, that's not a good thing, guys. <laughs> right? We want to create the one person responsible for these. And what's so interesting as well is I'll have companies that are larger sit down with their whole team. It's always a challenge. Sit with your whole team and say, hey, team, we're going to go through this list of KRAs, and I'm going to read it. I'm just going to read the KRA. And if, and if it's you, like if you're responsible for this, raise your hand, okay? Team says, oh, okay. You start going through, and you'll get to something like, uh, you know, property inspections. Fully complete the weekly inspection process on no less than 10 properties. You know, so say, you know, whatever it is, inspections. And you look around, hey, who does that? And everyone's like, I thought you, and, you, and then you use a boss, you're like, I thought you were doing that. And I quit doing that. Like, remember you told me to, like, to work on that other thing a couple months ago. I thought somebody else was doing that. No one's doing this? That, that happens, believe it or not. not. Not to you, not to any of us, but it happens. Yes, ma'am. Well, I go back to the website, yeah. Property management system. Now, from here you can also, if you want, you can download free samples of every one of our system manuals. They're just PDFs. Can't get the whole thing, but you can download like the first eight, nine pages. You can co copy and paste, guys, I don't care. But you can see exactly how we do that, how we have our system manual set up, because it's so, it's been so valuable for our company, yeah. 
Can we buy it? <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> yes, you can. You can, so we've got a tab on there, and, and you can buy our systems. We, you can buy an individual system. You can buy the whole package kind of a thing. Now, keep in mind, this is our systems, right? So this doesn't mean you go in and buy our systems, and like, it's not a plug and play. It's not like a, hey, great, here's the systems. Hey, team, here you go. It's our systems. This is the way we lease. You know, for example, remember that new account uh, comments I read a few moments ago on how we deal with owners? If that's not your business model, and you take our new account one, and you give it to your person, and suddenly they're turning leads away and they say to you, oh, well, I didn't hire him because it, that wasn't a good fit. And you're like, wasn't a good fit? What are you talking about? I want you to sign up everybody. Well, Mark's system manual said don't take everybody. So you're gonna need to go in and, and change the, the information, right? We use that folio, so ours is a little bit at folio bent wise as far as a process standpoint. But yes, we have our, our stuff in there. What a, what a great lead in question. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Mm, good question. How much do we let our software drive our systems versus the other way around? So this is not a right or wrong, this is just us. I don't want software to dictate to me how to, how to do stuff. Okay? What I want, and philosophically, I don't want an all-in-one box package. I don't want a website and an accounting system and a marketing system all in one, unless they're all the best. What I want philosophically as the business owner is the best website, that's why I use PMW, I want the best accounting software, the best tenant screening stuff, and the best of everything, and then my job is to kind of patch it together. I have to. Now, if I can find it all in one that's the best of the best, I'm, I'm going for it. Haven't found it yet. So, but I'm not gonna let the software dictate my process. Now, does that create some workarounds for me? Yes, absolutely does. But that's gonna be documented in the process. So for example, we don't use, we use Appfolio on our accounting side. We don't use Appfolio for marketing our properties. Um, we use PMW. And so that means the marketing of the properties has to run through PMW. So if somebody applies through the website, it doesn't automatically create the person in that folio. That's a, we've got to do it. It's a manual process. Now, it's, it's worth it for me as the business owner, because I think it's a better process that way. But it creates a little bit of inefficiency there. But I'm always going to approach it from the standpoint of what's best for the business. Not, not necessarily what's fastest, but what's the best software. And, and these things are kind of coming together, so I think... The softwares, as they get more integrated and things come together, it works a little better. Um, but I'm not going to let my software or anything else drive the process. I'm going to create the process and make that fit me, if that answers your question. Good question, though. Anything else at this point? Okay. How to measure and improve it. So you've got it. Now how do we measure it? How do we actually see if it's working? And how do we improve it? And we struggled with this for a long time. Like, what, what do I do? Do I just okay, say, okay, leasing person, there you go. Here's your measures of success. Good luck. Hope it works out. How do, how do we check in? How do we have accountability in a positive way? And this was a struggle for us for a long time because people would have it and they wouldn't do it. And I'd be like, it's right there. It's documented. Why aren't you doing it? Eh, I just didn't read it. Didn't follow up. You knew whatever. So the way we have, what we've stumbled onto to make this work is right here. One-on-one -on -one meetings. Guys? If you fell asleep for the last hour, fine, wake up for this, because this will be even more impactful than system manuals. If you, as the boss, aren't doing one-on-one -on -one meetings every single week, and yes, I did say every single week, with your directs, you're doing a disservice to your company and you're doing a disservice to them. One-on-one -on -one meetings are what successful companies do. We didn't invent this stuff. We just studied successful companies. We found out, huh, this is what they do. We should try it. We tried it, and it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I was, uh, oh, wait, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta, this, is, this is a sidebar question. So yesterday, I get on the airplane in Denver, terrible blizzard outside, and I was going to listen to a podcast on, um, oh, what was it on? It was uh, discipline, like how to be disciplined or something like that with your, with your life, you know, I mean, exercise better, have, have a disciplined life. And the, you know how if you listen to a podcast, sometimes they'll open up with a quote from the podcast, they'll just be like, you know, the, the best quote of the podcast. So hit play, and I'm thinking about, you know, I'm doing the systems class, and, I, and it's on discipline. And this, this is the first thing the podcast says. This guy pops up with the music in the background. So imagine music going on. We do not rise to the level of our goals. Rather, we fall to the level of our systems. It was like that angel. I was like, oh, I'm talking about systems tomorrow. I'm looking around, I was like, oh, that's awesome. And they, they went on to make the point that, you know what? It doesn't matter if you're a business owner, if you're trying to exercise, if you're trying to eat well. It doesn't matter what. Goals are fine. But we don't reach our goals. 
we fall to the level of our systems. Now, that resonated with me, because that's what happens to our company all day long. If we don't follow our systems, they don't matter. But as a company, I want to keep our systems high, because I know we're going to fall to that level. At, at best, at best, we're going to do what our systems say. So what we want to do is keep that bar high on the systems, which, which relates to as we're going to talk about these one-on-one -on -one meetings, because this is the people will fall to the level of the system in the one-on-one -on -one meeting. You guys don't seem very impressed by that quote. I thought it was amazing, all right? You guys are boring. I'll try it over here. We do not rise to the level of our goals. We fall to our systems. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, all right, all right, we'll go there. All right, so one-on-one -on -one meetings. It's one time per month with each individual. Now, if you've got 20 people, hopefully you have some managers in place, right? So I've got 20, we've got 20 people in our organization. They don't all report to me. I've got two VPs under me and every one of the people reports to them. They do one-on-ones, uh, and that's wrong. It should say one time per week. Ooh, sorry about that. I would blame my assistant, but I created my own slides, so I can't do that. One time per week, every single week. And you're thinking, Mark, that's crazy. One time per week, you know how much time that's gonna take? I don't have time for that. Up until three months ago, I did 10 one-on-ones every week with all 10 of my PMs, 10. And, and I'd have people say to me, Mark, that's a huge time commitment. And I would say, yes, it is. But you know what? I think it's the best day of my week because it, it allows me to connect with every single one of my PMs. And it's a whole day, but it allows me to keep my finger on the pulse of the organization. And one of the beautiful things about it is when you start doing this, it actually creates more time in your day. It creates more time in your day because one of the rules of one-on-ones between you and your employee, as I say, what's your name again? Mario. Mario, you're my employee, right? I'm explaining one-on-ones to you. So one, every Wednesday, we're going to sit down at 3 o'clock. Are you fired? No, that's going to come later. You might be fired later. If we don't do one-on-ones, you'll be fired. Okay, every Wednesday, 3 o'clock in my office are one-on-ones, right? Now, one of the purposes of one-on-ones is for me to answer your questions. So, it doesn't matter if Mario's on day one or, or year 10 with my company. During the week, if you've got questions for me, the question for you to ask yourself is, can this wait until our Wednesday meeting? If, the, if it can wait until Wednesday, you write it down in your notebook, and we'll address it Wednesday. If it's an emergency, it can't wait, yes, bring it to me. And I'm gonna do the same thing for you. I'm not gonna bug you all week long. So if I'm like, huh, I wonder if Mario got that, uh, that email sent. I'm not gonna go ask him. I'm not even gonna email him. I'm gonna write it down to ask him on Wednesday. If we follow that rule, do you realize how much time I just saved Mario and Mario just saved me by saving our questions to Wednesday? It's unbelievable. Now, people that actually engage in this, this is one of the hardest parts of one-on-ones because they, they forget. They still are so used to just popping in. Hey boss, you got a second? My people know if they ask me if I have a second, I'm, my response is always the same. Yes, I do, but can it wait till Wednesday? And half the time, even then, yeah, I can wait till Wednesday. And the beautiful thing about that is half of the things that they, they wrote down, they'll figure out themselves by Wednesday anyway, or the problem will go away. It just, it's, so it really does create more time in your day by doing that. All right, so one time per week, it's got to be calendared. It cannot be the, hey, when we get time this week, let's meet for a little bit of time. No, no, that doesn't work. It's got to be calendared the same day, the same time, every week, because that lets your employee know it's important to you as well. If you just say to them, you know, I'll, I'll catch him when I have a few minutes. Hey, Mario, um, now's a good time for me. You got a few minutes to meet for our one-on-one? -on -one? What's he going to say? Am <laughs> I fired? Well, he's going to say, sure, because the boss asked him. Is he prepared for it? Me? No. He's not, and, and does it make him think that this is an important meeting? Because I happen to have a few minutes. I don't care about his time. No, it's calendared. The same time, the same week, repetitive. Now, if you can't do it, now you have something to move on your calendar. Because I can't do my one-on-ones, even when I used to do them all. I'd, I'd be traveling. I couldn't do them. But now I have an, an item, an event to move, rather than just say, uh, hey, I'm, I guess I, oh, sorry, we missed it. It's been three weeks. I just realized we missed it. Put it on the calendar. They're about 20 minutes in length is all. This is not a day-long meeting. 20 minutes. So I schedule a half hour on my calendar for this, and it's 20 minutes. That's going to give me 10 minutes then to prepare for the next one after that. Not a long time, just 20 minutes. They go first, and this is a big part of it as well. Yeah? How firm do I hold the 20 minutes? I'll go closer to 30 with them if I need to, but at 30, I've got the next person coming in. So we're, we're cutting off. And, and depending on who your team members are, that can be tough, can it? Because does anybody have any team members that like to talk? I was, I was talking to a PM about this, and they were like, Mark, this person won't stop talking. What do, what do I do? Like, well, number one, you let him go. For the first couple of weeks, you just let him go. Let him go. But at, but at 30 minutes or 28 minutes, you say, okay, this has been great. Appreciate it. I've got another meeting in three minutes. We need to cut off. Remember, uh, next week we get together, 
it's like 10 minutes for you, 10 minutes for me, but thanks. Now, as it goes on, you may have to draw a firmer line on that kind of a thing, but typically employees will buy into that. Now, by they go first, here's how I suggest you start off the meeting. And, and if you're taking notes, write this down, because it has to be this exact verbiage. So tell me about your week. So tell me about your week. Mario comes into my office. It's our one-on-one -on -one meeting. And, uh, and I don't really know what to say, so I say, how's it going, Mario? What are you going to say? Good. Oh, okay. It's going good, he said. So, okay, what do we do from here? Now, if I say, so Mario, tell me about your week. Yeah, I went to this conference, learned a couple of things. Tall, dark, and handsome speaker. Yeah, I knew it. So tell me about your week is a conversation starter. And your, your team member, when you say, so tell me about your week, they may go to, oh, I've got this crazy owner situation I'm going through. They may go to a personal item. They'll go, let them go where they want to go. Because part of the, the reason for this one-on-one -on -one is the relationship. Right? You as the boss have an obligation to establish a strong relationship. This is part of doing that. So if they want to go and talk to you about their wedding, you know, one of my employees got married not too long ago, and she, you know, she, she couldn't stop talking about her wedding. Like, from, from my mean boss standpoint, I don't care about your wedding, okay? I'm a type A, like, let's get to the office, let's work, and go home. So I don't, I don't really want to know. But if that's important to her, it's important to me. And I, I had one team member say, it's like, so, so tell me about your week. And she started almost tearing up. She's like, oh, my, my dog, like, bit my cat's face off earlier this week. And I wanted to be like, look, your cat probably had it coming, okay? <laughs> it's a cat. It deserved it. I didn't say that. I wanted to say that. So I was like, oh, that sounds awful. How's your cat doing? <laughs> now, now, next week, I wrote down my little notebook, Ask Jessica about her stupid cat, right? kind of a thing. Because why? It's important to them, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cement that relationship a little bit. So I, I, you know, back to my, my gal that got married, um, and I'm terrible at this stuff. Like, I forget what's going on in my people's lives because I'm just like, I'm so type A driven, just get the job done. So I have to write down in my notebook and ask about the cat for the next week. And so when she's, Jessica's getting married, and so she was going off to Mexico to get married, so I wrote my thing, you know, ask about the wedding, because I'd forget, I would totally forget otherwise. So she comes into the office the next week, and she's tan, and just, you know, just go back to her, but she's all bubbling, and, and uh, she sits down, and I was like, ah, oh, so tell, I'm looking, so tell me about the wedding. Oh, you got married last week, I know that. And she's like, oh, it went great. And, and then she pulls out her wedding album. She's like, boom. She goes, you want to see pictures? I was like, yeah, I, let me see them. So she's like, here we are at the airport. Here we are getting on the plane. Here we're smart. We're sitting. Here we are with the stewardess. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Now, like, boss Mark could care less, right? But nice boss Mark, which there's a little bit of niceness still in me, right? I want to know about that stuff, kind of a thing. Now, we're, we're cutting it off in 20 minutes. I'm not here about a wedding for more than 20, but we're going to go there. All right. Use a spiral notebook. This is part of it as well. It's old fashioned, but it works like magic. And this, again, is what some big successful companies do. So don't say, Oh, I'll just, I'll take notes online. When you sit there, Mario, and you're typing on your computer with this, I don't know if Mario's taking notes on me or if he's doing emails. If Mario and I are doing a one-on-one -on -one, and I'm sitting there in the boss and I'm doing this, maybe I'm taking notes on our conversation, maybe I'm doing emails. And Mario doesn't know. And my eyes being down here is very different than my eyes being here talking to Mario and, and writing down a bullet point note on our conversation. There's again, there's something magical about the handwritten bullet point list that you're gonna write in your spiral bound notebook. And again, you're laughing at me because I'm old school. Guys, we've got, uh, you know, we've got a thousand doors. You should be impressed, okay? If it works for a thousand doors and 20 people, it should work for you. You're showing me your stylus there. But you're still writing, yeah. And, it, and it's easy then, because every week I have a next page, I just turn to the next page. So when they come in for the next week's meeting, I look back at my previous page, I see the open items that we didn't talk about, and I pick them up from there, where we left off. Yes, I use a separate notebook for each employee. Every team member, in my, when I used to do 10 of them, right, I, I, my bottom drawer, I had 10 notebooks. And each team member's name was written on the top. And that was, our, that was our team meeting. Now I'm down to only two individuals that report for me, so it's a lot easier for me. What if they work remote? Do you have any? If they work remote, it doesn't matter. You're still doing it. Well, I mean, so do you do Skype, phone? Or? When I couldn't be there in the past with some of my team members, we would still do it by phone. I mean, I suppose ideally you want to do it by Skype. But like, we're pretty religious on these things. We don't really miss. And the reason we don't miss is because I, as the boss, need to keep my finger on the pulse. I need to know what's going on. And this allows me as a control freak to get updated on issues, on things going on. And so I'll usually end the meeting with, okay, anything else I should know about as the boss? Any surprises that are gonna come to me that, that I should know about? 
because I don't like surprises. And so they may say, oh yeah, we've got this really upset owner. You know, just be ready. They might email you because they were just, they were hot the other day. Okay, good. Now I got the little FYI because I don't like surprises. I don't want to get that surprise email. I want to hear it from my team member, not from the individual. Yes? So the comment was, does it ever, do they tell me everything's okay and then a problem will pop up that I wasn't aware of? Uh, at this point in time, no. But if that were to happen, I think at my next meeting I would say, hey, so I got a call from Bill Smith and they told me they've been talking to you and there's been this issue with the water going on for the last two weeks and they called me. What's going on with that? And I'll say, da 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 I'll say, okay, like next time, give me a heads up. Let me know if you think it's going to rise to my level or if it's something I'm going to have a question about, I should be aware of, let me know. And then it's your job as the boss to let them know where that level is. So for example, I got one gal, and she's great about telling me everything. She, she tells me everything, like everything. And so I'm usually with her, I'm like, you know what? Let me just cut you off, I trust you, handle it, I don't need to know, next. She's like, okay, so I'm, I'm kind of training her on where that level of when do I inform Mark and when do I just handle it. So that's, that's, the, that's what you establish with your people. Just make sure you're consistent. Right? If you say, tell me every time someone's upset, then you better be okay with them telling you every time. If you say, I don't want to hear any of it, then don't get upset later when you're like, why didn't you tell me? Because you told me not to tell you. So you need to be consistent as the boss, I think. All right, we've got like four minutes. What other questions can I answer? Yes, ma'am. Great question. How, the question was, how, when do you start implementing this? Rolling this out to your employees is so important in the way you do it. Because if you go back home to your team member, you're like, hey guys, or, or gal, or person, we're gonna start meeting once a, once a week in a one-on-one. -on -one. What are they gonna think? Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Yeah. What did I do wrong? Oh man, they are, they've gone control freak on me. You're micromanaging me. That's what they're gonna say, right? So the way you explain it is like this, hey, this goofy guy from Colorado who'd probably been smoking too much marijuana was in there talking about these one-on-one -on -one meetings, right? He said this is what successful companies do. He said this is what good bosses do. I want to be a better boss. So for me to be a better boss, I was told that I need to start doing one-on-ones. We need to start doing one-on-ones. So we're going we're to do this. We're going to roll this out. Every week, Wednesday at 10 a.m. And I like Wednesday because it's like halfway in the week. They've got two days worth of work, two days to correct whatever you tell them to correct, right? So every Wednesday at 10, we're going to meet for, for 20 minutes just a check-in meeting for me to know what's going on. And, and it's gonna save us a lot of time because you're not gonna bug me with things, I'm not gonna bug you with things. And, and here's the deal, it's going to feel weird. And you tell them this, it's gonna feel weird at first. We're gonna be like, uh, what do we need to talk about? It's gonna feel weird for me, it's gonna feel weird for you, but we're gonna push through the weirdness. And if we get past the weirdness, it will be valuable. I promise you. No one I've ever, um, I do some PM coaching, like one-on-one like -on -one coaching, and I've had several people tell me Mark, like, I like the stuff you're saying, but this one-on-one -on -one stuff, that's the, best, that's the best advice you give them. That, um, which I almost take as an offense. I'm like, I say a lot of good stuff. Okay? No, but no, that's it. That's what they like. So if you push through the weirdness, this will be super effective. One of my, one more thing, and I'll, sorry, you got me on a roll here. One of my uh, two VPs, I've got a, a VP of property management and a VP of operations. So just only two directs that report to me now. My VP of operations, when I hired her, I was training her on this. You're gonna, re you're gonna do one-on-ones. And at this point in time, we were doing them every two weeks with all of our team members. I said, you're gonna do them, it's every two weeks. And she was like, what? This is the craziest thing I've ever heard. You want me to meet with 10 people once every two weeks? And, and I'm, you know, this is what? This, this is weird. I, don't I was like, just trust me. Trust the process, trust the system, do it. So she comes to me about, I don't know, two months later. I was like, so how's it going? She says, well, we're moving to every week. She goes, this is, this is amazing. I was like, really, you're doing it every week? She said, it's so effective, I can't believe I'm only doing it every two weeks. I need to do it every week. So she bought into the every week kind of a thing. So when you, when you go through this and you do it, it will pay dividends in ways you never knew. I had a, one of our gals sit down for one-on-one. -on -one. I said, Alexis, how's it going? Or, so tell me about your week. She breaks down in tears. And she says, my 13-year-old my daughter tried to kill herself this week. Oh. So she's crying. I'm trying not to cry, pull out the Kleenex, right, give her a hug. And, I'm like, what? like why, why are you here? Get out of here. Go home. Be with your daughter. And she, and she was like, no, I, I need to be here. Like, I, I need work right now. I need to focus on this. My daughter's good. She's taken care of. But So would, would, would she have come and just told me that 
unless we carved out time to have that conversation, not in a million years. Was it valuable for me as the boss to know that she's going through some crazy stuff? Yeah, you bet it is. Because if her work's starting to suffer and I'm like, hey, what's going on? You're not doing up to your normal work. She's not going to want to tell me that. Like this, this just benefits in so many ways. And that, like that one thing improved our relationship in such a strong way. And now I can be like, Get, you know, do what you need to do. Get out of here. If you ever need to go, just go. And she was like, oh, I appreciate that so, so much. Right? But those conversations don't happen by themselves. So you got to carve out the time. We do not do the date, like the daily huddles, that kind of stuff. No. Our people are pretty independent. They're pretty go, go, go. If I try to make my people meet every day, they, they hang me. So, no, we're not to that point yet. We do a monthly staff meeting. The question was, do we do a weekly staff meeting? We've got a once a, once a month all team meeting. Everybody's in, it's mandatory. It's about an hour long, I'm running that, and, and that's an effective, effective time as well. So do those meet. don't do wasted meetings, guys. Like meetings can be just, time sucks. If you don't like the way your meetings are going right now, then you need to change the way you're meeting. But don't stop meeting. Like our team meetings, they're one hour, and one, they do not go over one hour. If I'm not done in an hour, we're done. I better make it fit, and I better keep it moving, and I better keep it active from that standpoint. One more question, and we're done. Oh, I should have stopped a minute ago, because now it looks like nobody has any more comments. Teresa. How do we keep our KRA short? Was that your, comment, your question? How do we tie, uh, yeah. See, this could be an all day. I would love to talk about this all day. How do we, you can. We tie compensation into almost all of our KRAs, measures of success. If you meet it, you get paid for it. If you don't meet it, you don't get paid for it. So I'm a big believer in, in paid for performance. Even our accounting person has an, a, an aspect of commission to her compensation, and it's for late fees. For all the late fees we collect, because she's in charge of collecting them, she gets, I don't know, 15% of the late fees collected. Does that encourage or discourage her from charging late fees? That's another easy one, guys. She encourages, right? She gets a piece. If she waives a late fee, that's money out of her pocket. I'm happy to pay that because our late fee income went through the roof when we started paying her for that. So I love the idea of tying compensation into this. Check out th those system manual stuff. Again, if, if you like them, you can buy them on there. Um, we're talking more about this in our class uh, tomorrow. Hey, thank you guys for sticking. So here's our plan. We're going to take a 15-minute break. Let's come back here. It's a little extra. You know what? It's a little after three. Let's make it at three... 17, 317, we're going to have a one-hour Q&A with the four of the speakers.